Hello, BookTube. I have a small mail haul for you on this rainy day in Boston. Uh, don't know how many more packages there will be. Uh, there's only three right at the moment. <laughs> uh, there could be another big delivery later this afternoon, or it could be just that the mail carriers, it's its gross outside. They might just decide to skip it for a day. Uh, one way or another, we have uh, two manila envelopes and a box. So there might be something. I mean, the chances are low, but there might be something good. Uh, and I want to keep up uh, male transparency <laughs> as much as possible. Uh, someone else will also want to do mail. <laughs> so, uh, okay. Uh, okay, this first one is due in early October. I don't think we ever got an advanced copy of it. It's by Helena Rosenblatt. Uh from the great folks at Princeton University Press. This is The Lost History of Liberalism from Ancient Rome to the 21st Century. Uh, in this timely and provocative book, the author debunks the popular myth of liberalism as a uniquely Anglo-Saxon, Anglo-American tradition centered on individual rights. She shows that it was the French Revolution that gave birth to liberalism and Germans who transformed it. Only in the mid-20th century the concept become widely known in the United States, and then, as now, its meaning was hotly debated. Huh. Liberals were originally moralists at heart. They believed in the power of religion to reform society, emphasized the sanctity of the family, and never spoke of rights without speaking of duties. It was only during the Cold War and America's growing world hegemony that a liberalism was refashioned into an American ideology focused so strongly on individual freedoms. Interesting. Uh, okay, and, and coming right up. So, uh, <laughs> uh, uh, so it's it's openly political, and that that's that's tricky in this environment. But and this next one is not the box. The next one is a is a big orange envelope, the kind that will that will overjoy my little dog. <laughs> uh, but it, it feels heavy enough to be a finished copy. So I this will be. We'll give this. <laughs> oh, oh, oh. <laughs> oh my. Oh, okay. All right. Uh Oh my. <laughs> okay. This is a big one. In every sense of the word, this is not a finished copy. This is a thousand page uh advanced copy. Uh, I don't have a pub sheet, but I hardly need one. This is Gandhi, The Years That Changed the World, 1914 to 1948, by Ramachandra Gula, the author of Gandhi Before India. The first volume, the volume before this one was uh, came out a few years ago, was uh, the story of Gandhi, you know, dressed as an ordinary English undergraduate uh, before he became the icon. The controversial icon, one way or another, and that look at this. This is this is that book. This is the life of that Gandhi, of the the Gandhi that we all think of when we think of him. Uh, yeah. So Gandhi Before India came out in uh, 2014, and has a million blurbs here in this book. And this one is uh, the second and concluding volume of a magisterial biography that began with the acclaimed Gandhi Before India the definitive portrait of the life and work of one of the most abidingly influential and controversial men in world history. Wow. Okay. Using a wealth of material, Gua creates a portrait of Gandhi and those closest to him, friends, family, pol political and social leaders, that illuminates the complexity inside his thinking, his motives, his actions, and their outcomes as he engaged with every important aspect of social and political life in, in, in the India of his time. Oh, boy. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. Oh. Uh, okay, so this is due when? October. I don't have a pub sheet, but this is due in October. This is due fairly soon, right around the corner. Oh, the 2nd of October, early October. So it's time to start in. It's time to start reading this right away. Okay, <laughs> fantastic. 
Uh, and then we have the box, which now feels anticlimactic uh, because I've got a thousand page biography that I wasn't uh, salivating for forever. What is this? What is this? Oh, do you want some cardboard, baby? Some fiber for your diet? Yes. <laughs> the Frida Cam is on the job. <laughs> Thought I'd keep her busy for a minute or two. <laughs> so, what have we got here? What is this next one? Oh. Okay, wonderful. Oh boy. Alright. Uh, this is the paperback. Of uh, wow, okay. This is the paperback of Jonathan Dimbley's *The Battle of the Atlantic*, classic World War II military history. Uh, that has blurbs on it from Douglas Brinkley and Max Hastings. Uh, huh, oh, that's frustrating. Uh, it has blurbs on it uh, on the book from Douglas Brinkley and Max Hastings. However, on the included pub sheet, it has it, the pub sheet starts off with two enormous blurbs, one from the Wall Street Journal and one from Open Letters Monthly. In fact, it's the very first thing. <laughs> it's my review in Open Letters Monthly. All right, so that's that's a little frustrating. That is in the uh, the pub sheet, but not on the book. So those of you who will be seeing this, you, those of you in America who will be seeing this paperback in bookstores, will not be seeing the, the words of yours truly. Perhaps you should read them together. Hmm? Uh, in his fantastic new book, the Battle of the Atlantic. British writer and broadcaster Jonathan Dimbley sets out to reclaim the centrality of the Atlantic in the war's narrative and to tell its dramatic story. Terry Hughes and John Costello did this early, did this nearly 50 years ago in a book likewise called The Battle on the, of the Atlantic, and there have been other retellings in intervening decades. Dimbley's account distinguishes itself from others mainly in his tremendous storytelling energy and his dramaticist eye for capturing personalities. And that, I guess, was too long-winded <laughs> for the paperback. But I'm glad to have the paperback, because I don't think... I, the same old refrain on this channel. I don't think I still have the hardcover. Uh, great. I will, I will, of course, include the pub sheet in the paperback for my own private use, for my own viewing, even though nobody else gets to see that. Wow. Okay. Not a bad mail haul for, uh, for only three packages. So we have... Uh, Gandhi. By Ramachandra Gula. This goes on the reading list tonight. Uh, we have The Battle for the Atlantic in paperback, and we have uh, The Lost History of Liberalism by Helena Rosenblatt, uh, unearthing what it sounds like the embarrassing the religious roots of classic liberalism. Uh, embarrassing for the 21st century, anyway. Uh, but that's not a bad, a bad little mail haul for a pouring rain day. Uh, and, of course, like anybody else with half a soul, I can't complain about the rain. It's, it's humid and it's rainy here in Boston. It's dark. But no one in America can complain about bad weather considering the, the absolute catastrophe that is still headed straight for the mid-Atlantic states, for, for uh, North and South Carolina. There's a massive hurricane. The hurricane Florence, the eye of Hurricane Florence alone, is 40 miles wide. The best case scenario now is that this enormous thing uh, badly falters when it hits the land shelf and when it hits the massive air over land, that it badly falters and breaks apart, or that a significant part of its strength breaks apart. That's the best-case scenario. That best-case scenario still calls for 100-mile-an-hour winds and, and uh, water surges up to, the, the, to, to your breastbone. Uh, the worst-case scenario is that in... in doesn't do that, that it maintains a lot of its strength and just stalls in place, tearing roofs off houses and dumping buckets of water for who knows how long, I, all weekend. <laughs> so I, I, I can't complain about a little rain in Boston. <laughs> so so I'll, uh, I'll wrap this up for now. really don't know what more to expect today, but uh, if what I get, you will see. <laughs> so until then, uh, uh, thank you, BookTube. I'll see you soon.